You ever watch a movie and by around the midway point have a pretty good idea on how that movie should end? That's how tonight feels for the Sacramento Kings. A poetic ending, really, to fall and have your season ended at the hands of the New Orleans Pelicans, who beat you six times this year. It might be fitting, but it doesn't make it any less painful. Sacramento falls to New Orleans 105-98 in the final play-in game, meaning they missed the playoffs by just one game. We're breaking it all down right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. I'm here inside the Smoothie King Center, sitting on the court, on the floor, where the Kings season just came to an end. Like I said in that introduction, a poetic ending to the year, and not just because it came at the hands of the New Orleans Pelicans. Now, I haven't checked the history books. I haven't seen anybody tweet about it, but we'll have to see. I don't know if a team has ever lost to another team six times during the same regular season. Like, not preseason, not playoffs, like six times. Technically, this final one is postseason, but not playoffs, so it doesn't really count towards either. But either way, without the preseason and without the playoffs, the Kings lost to the Pelicans six times in the same year. That's absolutely absurd. I don't know if that's been done. It hasn't been done for a long, 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 long time. But unfortunately, it happened to the Kings this year. I don't know if this is going to be a common thing, playing a team five or six times with a new play-in tournament and with the in-season tournament. I don't need to see the, the New Orleans Pelicans for a long time. Wouldn't mind coming back to New Orleans because it's my first time here. Absolutely beautiful city. Super hospitable people. And, and I'll be honest, too, this city has a reputation of not really being a basketball town. I know this was a big game, and I know the Pelicans played really well, so that probably affected the volume in the crowd. This crowd was into it. This building was loud. It's, it's no Golden One Center, but truth be told, a lot of teams, a lot of cities don't have the atmosphere like the Golden One Center. Sacramento's just special. Sacramento's different. But this crowd was lively. It was fun. It was a great environment to watch a basketball game. Didn't get the result that I wanted, certainly, but had a good time here uh, in New Orleans. So I wanted to say that first and foremost. But it's not just poetic that the Kings lost at the hands of the Pelicans. This whole week, in general, is poetic for Sacramento. It is, to me, a perfect representation of how this this season went the ups and downs of this roller coaster ride season right you go into Tuesday you dominate the Golden State Warriors with your defense playing really really well and your offense showing up in a major way even dealing with the injuries to Malik Monk and Kevin Herter you had Keegan Murray go for 30 plus De'Aaron Fox looked good Demonte Sabonis looked good uh, good uh, output from Harrison Barnes the Kings offense looked solid and sustainable and the defense was new and improved to the level that that we were hoping for coming into this season, or at least a level that Mike Brown was hoping for coming into this season. 48 hours later, you come and lay an egg in New Orleans. Your defense was good enough to win, and your offense, which we've been talking about all season long, your offense dropped the ball. I mean, I'll tell you exactly what happened in this game, right? I'll summarize it perfectly for you. Momentum is a massive thing in sports and especially in basketball. And the Kings came into the Smoothie King Center tonight with all the momentum and the Pelicans had little to none of it. Let me just set the scene for you of how these teams entered this building, right? I mentioned the, the Kings win over the, the, the Golden State Warriors, winning it on the backs of their defense, right? Uh, exercising that demon, knocking out Golden State, who, of course, knocked them out last year. Kings coming in with confidence, even though they lost to the Pelicans five times. In many ways, a single elimination game against a team that's had that much success against you, 
It's kind of the perfect scenario. You probably didn't want to take on the Pelicans in an actual best of seven series because the Pelicans are likely beat you four times more than or more often than you beat them four times, right? But in a one game, anything can happen on any given night. This was the scenario for Sacramento to make up for those five regular season losses with a win tonight. That would have meant so much more. Meanwhile, the Pelicans came into tonight's game having lost six straight games at home, seven of their last eight at home, including two straight losses to the Los Angeles Lakers that knocked them from guaranteed sixth place to one loss away from missing the playoffs outright. I think this was the third straight year that the Pelicans were a play-in team, and I had it from New Orleans fans, Pelicans fans, Pelicans media members telling me, like, this, this fan base was kind of sick of it, right? Like, the, 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 the energy coming into this building was, I know we got to get this win. I know it is, it's against a Kings team that we've been very, very good against, but we shouldn't even be in this position to begin with, not to mention the injury to Zion Williamson after scoring 40 points against the Lakers. He's out not playing in this game, and the Kings have no answer for a player like Zion. So the momentum was completely on the side of the Kings coming into this game, and they truly started this game playing like it. Right, Sacramento comes out of the gate in attack mode on defense the exact same way they did against the Golden State Warriors. Right, They force like uh, six turnovers in the first quarter alone and score 11 points off of those six turnovers. 11 points off of turnovers in a quarter is fantastic to start the game. Here's the problem. You completely had the Pelicans number early. We're forcing them to turn the ball over. They had no rhythm to their offense whatsoever. But with the exception of those 11 points off the turnovers, with the exception of 19 points from Fox and Sabonis in the first quarter, your offense didn't do anything else. You didn't take advantage of it, right? 19 of your 24 points in the first quarter came from Fox and Sabonis, and the Kings started the game shooting one of six from three-point range. Eventually, the Pelicans settled in, and they gained confidence and gained momentum back on the defensive end of the floor, right? They realized, okay, yes, we're, we're playing sloppy. We're not playing well offensively, but the Kings have failed to create any separation. The largest lead the Kings had was seven points in this game. Kings didn't take advantage of that at all. They didn't create any separation. The Pelicans started turning the Kings over, stopping the Kings playing physical with Sacramento to where you could see them get a swagger, get an energy like, oh yeah, here we go again. We beat this team five times. We've punked this team all season long. We've out physical them all season long. They can't score on us. Keegan Murray can't get free. Let De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis do their thing because nobody else got it. Keon Ellis is his breakout star after the Tuesday night game. He's not scoring on us or really not doing anything on offense. The Kings bench isn't doing anything. Oh, yeah, we got this. We're going to wake up offensively, but defensively we know that this Kings team is not going to beat us. You could see that. You could watch them. You, I watch them in person here. The body language shift, the mindset shift from a nervousness and a disappointment to be even playing this game to a oh we got this oh we're good oh this king's team can't touch us they can't hang with us we got this team's number I, we watched it happen before our very eyes the kings turned the ball over nine times in the first half the same amount of turnovers they forced from new orleans in the first half so that advantage right there is negated altogether and the pelicans scored 32 points on 54 percent shooting from the field, 50% from three-point range, and 80% from the free-throw line shooting in the second quarter alone. That second quarter happens. They wake up offensively. The Kings' offense is still struggling. They take a lead going into halftime. I'm not saying game was over at that point because Kings had more than enough time to battle back and had an opportunity to. But the Pelicans took control, got their confidence back, and at that point it was too little too late. Like To me, the Kings needed to put this game away early. Right, the Kings, and I'm not saying like, oh, by the second quarter this game should have been over. But what I mean by that is you needed to crush the spirit of this Pelicans team. Right, they came in here frustrated to even be here, down a man. Fans were upset to even be playing this game. Right, they came into this game. I'm not going to say with the wrong mindset, but they were vulnerable. And we saw in the first quarter, at least defensively, the Kings take advantage of that vulnerability, but they allowed the Pelicans to hang around. They didn't, for lack of a better term, step on their throats, put the nail in the coffin. Whatever analogy you want to use, the Kings did not put this game away or really take firm control, grab it by the throat when they could have and when they should have. 
you let the Pelicans get momentum, then they remember, oh yeah, we've beaten you five times and this is how we've beaten you. And the Kings had no answer for it. All night long, offensively, they had no answer to it. Similar to much of this season, the offense just lets you down. That's it. The offense let you down. He only scored 98 points. He shot 11 of 41 from three-point range, 26%. Tonight, your season died with the three-point shot, which to this team, for this team, is, is really fitting. And I promise you, the majority of those 41 threes weren't spray threes that the Kings were trying to generate. A lot of those, they were chucking in the third and fourth quarters looking for home runs when Mike Brown asks for singles. Kings were looking for home runs to try and get themselves back into this game. But truth be told, when it mattered most, right, late third quarter, the Kings are down by seven points. They get two possessions back-to-back -back where they get stops and have a chance to get that to within five or four points going into the fourth quarter. You haven't played well. The Pelicans have had momentum for most of the second half, really since the second quarter, but you're in a position to where all you need is one good quarter and you can escape New Orleans with a win and keep your season alive. Instead, in both those possessions, the Kings resulted in either back-to-back -back turnovers. One for sure was a turnover, and the other one was maybe just a bad shot or a missed shot. Kings just did not take advantage on the offensive end when they needed timely buckets. They shot 15 of 22 from the free throw line, 68%. 44 points in the paint in general. Now, you look at 15 of 22, you see seven missed free throws there. You see the Kings lose by seven points. You're like, Matt, there's the game. Not really. The game, 105 to 98 is a respectable final score. The Kings were down by 20 points midway through the fourth quarter. Right? They scored a lot of their buckets in garbage time to try and make one last gasp that really had no chance to begin with. The game was not as close as this final score uh, uh, suggests. Right? It, it really wasn't that close. The Kings were thoroughly beat in this game by more than just seven points. And defensively, like the Kings did their job. That's what's so frustrating. They held the Pelicans to 105 points. More than that, they held the Pelicans to 36%, 7 of 19 from three-point range. That's what makes this game different from all the other five that they lost to the Pelicans. They were torched from the perimeter game after game after game, whether Zion was playing or not, Brandon Ingram was playing or not, did not matter. The Pelicans torched the Kings from the perimeter all season long. That was a focal point of the Kings coming into this game. Limit the three-point shots. They did that. They executed their defensive game plan. And they still lost. They held Brandon Ingram to only 24 points. With Zion out, that's great. They held C.J. McCollum, who's lit their asses up all year long. They held C.J. McCollum to seven points. And they still lost. Because their offense, that primary strength of theirs, this fear that I've had manifesting and I've talked about over and over again for the course of this entire season, this fear of the offense, the primary strength of this Kings team not being consistent enough. I know that Mike Brown didn't want a team to be the team that scored 120 points to win. This season, Mike, the play-in tonight, you did not have to be, but you had to be able to score more than 98. You just had to beat 105, which last season for the Kings, 105 points, they did that in three quarters half the time. The offense let them down. That's really the story of this season. The defense was great. It was much improved. There were great moments. The offense let the Kings down. And on top of that, the Pelicans bench, those guys showed up. They scored 34 points. The Kings bench 12. And the vast majority of those points were from Davion Mitchell, who still had an overall bad game. Trey Lyles didn't do anything. Alex Len really struggled. Like, the Kings just didn't get enough offense from really anybody. De'Aaron Fox did his thing, but turned the ball over way too much. DeMontis Sabonis had a decent start to this game, also turned the ball over a lot, didn't score enough when the Kings needed him to as well. The offense lets you down. And really... It's hard to classify this season as any more than a disappointment. But I'm not going to go as far as failure. I'll explain why here in just a second. Today's episode of the Long Time Kings podcast is brought to you by a few great sponsors. The first being Yahoo Finance. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You've saved, you've researched, you've invested in all that you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using what every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every 
great investor, whether you're a seasoned investor or looking for some extra guidance. Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data that you need in one place. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial or the fi yeah, financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Secure, uh, you can securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments, a comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance earns uh, ensures that you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. With a community of over 90 million users each month, their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor. That's yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL, plus MLB season is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on all of the action. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. All you have to do is sign up, place a bet, Win or lose, you're getting $150 in bonus bets. Bet on any, everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and easy to use. The Kings on FanDuel tonight came into this game actually as one-and-a-half-point favorites. Now, to be fair, one-and-a-half points is basically a pick 'em. It's a push, uh, or you're, you're picking one team over the other, and it's, it's a really close. Like, these two teams were pretty even coming into tonight, which I thought was the right thing. Now, of course, the Pelicans covered pretty easily with this win here tonight, so you probably didn't cash in on that, but you still have time to cash in on Malik Monk, hopefully winning NBA sixth man of the year. He absolutely deserves to win it over Nas Reed. You can bet on that. So many things on FanDuel. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So I want to hear from you a lot with what I'm going to talk about in this next segment because there's not a right or wrong answer. It's really a it's really a feeling, right? It's based off of your expectations and what you put to the table and whether it's emotional, logical, whatever you want it to be. To me, 100% this season is a disappointment for the Sacramento Kings. But I don't, I don't consider it a failure. And I'll get into why. But is it a disappointment to you? Is it a failure? Is it expected? Like how, what is your reaction to this season as a whole? And we're going to dive deeper into this in the coming days and coming weeks, right? It's still very raw. The season came to an end. We still got a lot coming and I'll share with you in the next segment, like content that I have planned here for the Locked on Kings podcast. But the disappointment is, is very clear for me, right? You lost two or excuse me, you won two fewer games than you did last year. Those two fewer games dropped you all the way from third seed to ninth, and you ended up finishing in the appropriate seed. You ended up finishing ninth in the Western Conference, right? You missed the playoffs by one spot. So a new playoff drought has started, I guess you can say. Hopefully it doesn't last beyond one year, and, and the Kings have a lot of work to do this offseason. We'll get into that too. But it's definitely a disappointment, right? To me, there there were positives. There were there there were areas where there was growth, right? There was defensive improvement, right? There was DeMondis Sabonis' double-double streak, the emergence of Keon Ellis. There were a number of things from this season that, that were positive, right? Made me feel good, and there, there were certainly aspects of this season that I enjoyed. So it wasn't a depressing, damaging, horrendous season by any means. But the disappointments, the failures, the struggles of this season outweigh the positives because this is a results-oriented league. The Kings came into la uh, this season as the third seed. Yes, they were a first-round playoff exit, but they were talking about getting back to the playoffs and hopefully winning a playoff series. Mike Brown and De'Aaron Fox were using the word contending for uh, contending for a championship. Like, th this team had certainly higher expectations, and the fans and myself all had higher expectations than being eliminated in the play-in, which is where the Kings ended up. This is a results-oriented league, and look, I know, you're the, I know the Western Conference was ridiculous this year, right? The fact that you lose uh, or win two fewer games and it's the difference between three and nine, that's a, that's a big difference. But the West being difficult is not an excuse, right? Like, keep up or shut up. The West is tough. Get over it. Deal with it. You got to play. You got you, you to gotta meet it. You got to beat it. Like, you want to beat the best. This is the NBA, right? Every single team has talent. Most teams now are stacked to some capacity. And even that, like, 
as much as I want to just harp on the West and go, man, the West was so brutal this year, hopefully it won't be as bad. Or the, like That's the reason why the Kings ended up in this position. It's not because they were a, a terrible team or anything. I don't believe the Kings were a terrible team by any means. But they regressed when the vast majority of the West improved. On top of that, though, you lost to all three bottom teams in the Eastern Conference. You lost to the Portland Trailblazers, a bottom feeder team in the West. You blew a huge lead in the fourth quarter to the Phoenix Suns. You choked away a, a game against the Bucks in Milwaukee. Now, sure, there are games over the course of this season, too, that the Kings won where maybe they shouldn't have won or they weren't supposed to win, but not as many as the games that they were supposed to win that they ended up losing. How many 20-point leads or 16-point leads did this Kings team blow this year? They put themselves in this position. In fact, DeMondis Sabonis, after the game, said basically echoed the exact same thing that I'm saying. He said, it's not an excuse. Like, we put ourselves here, and we can't blame anybody but ourselves. They're right. Like, yes, the West sucks. It's tough. But you had plenty of opportunities to win games that you were supposed to win so that you wouldn't even be in this position in the first place. Now, maybe the Kings ended up end up as a sixth seed and, and who they play, some, play in the first round, the Timberwolves or whatever? They lose to the Timberwolves in five games or six games or maybe even the swept by the Timberwolves in the first round. We're still disappointed, for sure, by that result. But at least you made a playoff series. You didn't even make the playoffs this year. So I'm not here for the West is difficult excuse. I'm not here for, like, like oh injuries or things like that. Like, you lost a lot of these games that you should have won with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter still playing. Now, I understand that you went through your biggest slide down the stretch when you had to get wins. You went through that slide because you were missing Fox and Herter. I'm not dismissing that by any means. But this is a position you put yourself in, right? And injuries happen to every single team. Some teams are more lucky than others. We know how lucky the Kings were injury-wise last season. I just, to me, there's not excuses that can be made about this, this season. Now, I don't, though, classify it as a failure. Because, one, I think that term is, is, is too narrow-minded and doesn't take context of an entire season into account, which is important. But, like, they still grew tremendously on the defensive end. And... Failure to me is incomplete or the chance of this season to be a failure is incomplete because the, the way that I accept this season, the way that this season can be turned into a positive is a, 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 a way to look at this. And I've talked about this before over the course of this, uh, this pod, uh, over the course of the season on this podcast before. If this season is about finding which guys you know you can actually win a title with and which guys from last season's fun, great vibes that are kind of along for the ride or help you kind of, but you need to do more or you need more to get you where you want to go. If that's what this season is about and then you take that context, you take that what you've learned and you actually do something about it this offseason, that's where I could say, okay, this season is a, is, is a success or you've turned this season into the biggest positive you can. Now, if you don't do anything with the information that you learned this, this summer and you basically roll again, roll it all back and run it all back again next season, we got a problem, right? And I think Monty McNair knows that. Like, that's where our attention is going to shift now, right? The ball is in Monty McNair's court. The ball is in the court of this Kings front office. They have to make moves this offseason. And it could be a combination of things, right? Number one, first and foremost, you got to bring back Malik Monk. Now, De'Aaron Fox actually spoke about Malik Monk's future, and, and some Kings fans are reacting a little bit negatively to it. I'll, I'll play that audio for you here in, in just a little bit. But Malik Monk coming back is absolutely priority number one. Priority number two, and th maybe this is a, the order for two or three or whatever could be a, a different. Number one is absolutely Malik Monk. But other than that, the Kings need wing depth, 100%. Like A team like the New Orleans Pelicans that is stacked with length at the wing, Sacramento clearly has had issues with all season long. So they need more wing depth. They need more athletic, lengthy guys. On top of that, the Kings might need another big swing player. Right? Like I, I do believe De'Aaron Fox is a star in this league. I absolutely believe that you can win with him and DeMontis Sabonis. But taking that next step, not just 
to win a championship, but to compete with the teams in the Western Conference that I don't think are going anywhere, most of them. And if anything, some of the younger teams like the San Antonio Spurs, the Houston Rockets, the even the Utah Jazz to some extent, they can get better quickly. Like, the Kings might need another name. I don't know if it's like uh, Michael Bridges from the the, the, the the Brooklyn Nets. Maybe the Kings make a big swing at him. It's going to be tough to do, though, because of their draft pick situation. That's another thing for Monty to figure out. Now, by my understanding, the Kings basically have the best odds of the 13th pick. They have like a 5% chance of moving into the top four. It's not going to happen. The Kings cannot waive the... Uh, the, the protections on the pick outright. They can't just decide, you know what? Atlanta, take the pick. We don't want it. They can't do that. They have to honor their agreement. But what, essentially what they can do is they can make another trade. They can take the 13th pick, trade it to Atlanta essentially for the pick next year with protections on it that is owed to the Hawks. But Atlanta has to agree to do that. So Atlanta has to agree to take the 13th pick, what we believe is going to end up being the 13th pick this year, and give you your protected pick back. That's the only way that you free up your draft picks going forward to make a big swing like for a Bridges or a Lowry Markinen or whatever type player that you're interested in going out and getting. If not, you can trade the pick on draft night, but that doesn't help free up your future picks for making a big splash move. So that muddies the waters a little bit. But there's no excuse, in my opinion, no excuse for Monty McNair. you got to make moves this season. I'm not saying he's been sitting on his hands. I understand he's tried to make moves and things have fallen through or the circumstances weren't right. I get that. I know Monty's not going to make a stupid move, but you got to do something. You're not, it's not good enough to try and nothing happens because it, wasn't, it didn't make sense, right? you got to do something this offseason. It starts with Malik Monk and making improvements that this roster needs. We'll go in more in depth in the near future about which players I think the Kings should keep, which players I think the Kings should move on from. That'll be all in a future episode. But you best believe this is a massive offseason for the Sacramento Kings, and Monty McNair has a lot that he and his front office need to accomplish. Locked on Kings is brought to you by one more great sponsor that's LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They help you hire professionals that can help or that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job that might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, or over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. You can hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a lot of hats and they might not have the resources or the time to go through the proper hiring process. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even have just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So I wanted to play for you a couple of sound bites from post game after tonight's loss. The first, like I mentioned earlier, is De'Aaron Fox talking about Malik Monk's future. I mean, obviously, I think he was, he, he was extremely big for us. Um, you know, people that watch us play know that he should be six man of the year, but um, at the end of the day, you know that this is a business, and I feel like what he what he gave to us in this two, in the two years that he has been here, um, I feel like he showed his value, what he what he can do for a team, and um, I mean I'll be, I'm happy for him regardless if he's with us or or he isn't, and, um, and he knows that. But man, at the end of the day, this is this is a business. You can only play basketball for so long. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, for sure. But, you know, uh, money talks. Like I said, you can't play this game for, forever. You know, we, we have a – you have such a short window to play basketball. Obviously, not everybody's going to be Braun or, or, or CP and play 19, 20 years. So um, you have to be able to get paid whenever you can, obviously. And, I mean, um, that's what Vince Carter told me. And he played 21, 22 years, 21 years. So, um, 
Nah, man, Malik's, like I said, Malik's, Malik was great for us. Obviously, I would love to have him back, but, you know, I don't, I don't know what the future holds. Now, I'm curious how your reaction is to this clip. Because for me, I heard Mar uh, 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 De'Aaron say this. I was in the same room with De'Aaron, and I didn't take it as he thinks Malik is gone. I took it as him saying, like, of course he wants Malik Monk back, but money talks. And if Malik gets the bag elsewhere and decides to chase that money, De'Aaron's not going to blame him for that. That's what I took from it, which is we've already we've always known this, right? We've already the Kings can only offer him up to a certain amount. If a team like Orlando or San Antonio or someone else with cap space comes in and throws the bag at Malik Monk and says, "Here's a bunch of money, you can start for us." If Malik decides to take that and leave Sacramento, it's hard to blame him for that. So that's what I took away from that De'Aaron Fox soundbite. Also, De'Aaron Fox and Demontis Sabonis talked about Keegan Murray and Keon Ellis. Both of them had a really rough night tonight. Keegan. 11 points, 4 of 12 shooting from the field, 7 rebounds, 3 assists, a steal, a block. Keon Ellis, 0 points, 0 of 5 from the field, 1 assist, 2 blocks. Both of them were so good on Tuesday, the high, then they have this rough night tonight, the low. Young players are going to go through highs and lows, and De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis talked about what it's like to go through that. Yeah, man, those things happen, but you have to be able to just stay the course. It's, uh, it's hard to be in this league. It's, it's hard. Um, Nothing's going to come easy. Obviously, you know, someone like Keon had, you know, went undrafted, ended up fighting for a spot, and, you know, he was in a, in a, in a play-in game starting. So, um, you know, they, they, those guys put in the work, and consistency, consistency comes with that, especially as you, as you start to get older, as you start to get used to this league. Uh, but it's never going to come easy. Uh, you just got to stay uh, f f focused, you know, and, um, you know, never get too high, never get too low. You know, it's a long season different matchups, different players, you know, and uh, you just got to try and be as consistent as you can, you know, because uh, that's what uh, the team needs from you. There was plenty more sound and quotes from uh, post game after this Kings loss tonight. If you want to check those out, you can go to my uh, my U or, uh, Twitter account at Matt George Sack. You can see all the videos and, and sound uh, that I posted there. Before we wrap up, I do want to say thank you so much for another great season here. This is season number seven for me, I think. Seven or eight, I honestly can't remember, of hosting the Locked on Kings podcast. I think it's number seven. I'm, I'm blown away by the support. It just gets better and better every single year. Met so many of you from around the country, not just in Sacramento. Met some of you here in New Orleans. Met uh, many of you in Salt Lake City when I went to Salt Lake City earlier this year. Hell, I even met some of you in Vegas when we were there for the Super Bowl, right? I'm so unbelievably blessed to host this Locked On Kings podcast for you fans. Obviously, this is not the way we wanted the year to end. It's not a doomsday by any means, right? The Kings have work to do, but they're still a very good basketball team. They still finished the season 10 games above 500. It was a good season. The result, not what we wanted. Disappointing to say the least, like we talked about, but it was a good season, and so much of what made this season good was you and your support for Locked On Kings. We also had our first ever local sponsor, which was Sackyard held live watch parties, our first ever live Locked on Kings podcast, which was incredible. I'm so unbelievably blessed. I'm so thankful for this year from a, 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 a Kings fan like you who grew up loving this team to be able to do this as a job and host this podcast for you. I'm so incredibly blessed. So thank you so, so much. Now we're not done. I'm not going anywhere because Locked on doesn't stop going into the postseason, right? We may, or the off season. We may have playoffs to worry about, and we may not want to watch the playoffs because our Kings aren't in it. Maybe it's a little too painful for us right now. But the Kings conversation continues, right? Pretty soon we're going to have the, the Kings exit interviews at, uh, at the Golden One Center press conferences from all of the, the top players. We'll probably hear from Mike Brown, maybe hear from Monty McNair, right? So I'll have all that from you. We'll break down those comments and things that are said here on Locked on Kings. I'm going to go through, like I said, a, a list of this uh, this roster and pick which guys I think are keepers for the Kings and which guys the Kings should be looking to replace. They're not going to get rid of all of them and replace all of them, right? But which guys I think Monty should be looking to upgrade or move on from. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Malik Monk and his future and everything that happens with that as it evolves over the course of the season. I'm going to give out grades for every player, the coaching staff, the front office for this season as a whole. There's so much content coming for you. We'll even get ready for the draft. As of right now, the Kings have a draft pick, so we'll look at prospects that they could potentially take at 13, where they end up at the end of the draft lottery, although I'm not expecting much. Like, there's so much still to come here on Locked on Kings over the course of this offseason, so do not go anywhere. If you need to take a break for a while now that the season is over, I understand that, but just know 
Locked On Kings isn't going anywhere. Your off-season hub, we got you. We'll get you through these long months until Kings basketball returns again in October. Feels so far away, I know, but we'll get there together. Thank you for an amazing season. Thank you for tuning into this Locked On Kings podcast. Feel free to get loose in the comment section down below on YouTube or send me your thoughts at Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me, mattgeorgesports at gmail.com. Love to keep the conversation going with you there. Until the next podcast, safely back in Sacramento, hopefully. I'm hopping on a plane tomorrow. I appreciate your support. Can't wait to have you join me then. My name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked On Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.